Today we have another Hometown Historian Channel production. Enjoy. again uh, hometown historian channel this is the second part of the John Augustus Sutter uh, series of videos uh, we're also going to do one uh, Laura Klotz from marker quest had uh, sent me a picture of the historic marker inlet it's for John Augustus Sutter so we'll wind up doing a Pennsylvania historic marker which will be short to the point and sort of actually filmed uh, at his grave site so that will be part of that. And we'll talk a little bit about the home that's on the National Registry of Historic uh, Buildings and Places. Uh, this video, though, we're going to go into who he was and the events that took place at Fort Sutter. And uh, sort of from that point to the end of his life and what had happened um, with a lot of different statements from different individuals. Because a lot of times... Sometimes you could have a defamation of character, those types of things, where you'll have one person or you'll have several people from a same group that sort of has a problem with the guy. And you sort of sometimes want to wonder, is there an ulterior motive here, like a defamation of character, those types of things. In this case, though, you had people from a wide plethora Group of groups and, and individuals, uh, and, and he was generally not liked. Um, so I'm sure that played a role in people not having a problem with saying how they felt about things. But these were first person witnessed events of what actually went on, and they talked deeply about it and the discontent of seeing those types of events going on. So we're actually going to go into that. So we'll start off by once again, sort of discussing how we got to the point of Sutter's Fort, uh, where uh, the new Helvetia, I think is uh, probably not pronouncing that correctly, but it's basically New Switzerland is what it stood for, and, uh, and how he came about. So he had made various connections when he came you know, across, across America, eventually wound up sailing to Hawaii, I guess he wound up missing a boat or something like that, so he wound up spending four months there, <coughs> which was actually advantageous uh, to be there in the Kingdom of Hawaii because he wound up meeting quite a few different influential individuals from different, different governments. Uh, he presented himself, uh, one, as a citizen of France, which I don't think he ever was. Um, he was an American citizen and eventually would become a Mexican citizen as well. He spoke several different languages, so he was very intelligent in his way that he pre presented himself. Uh, he would present himself as Captain John Augustus Sutter, that he was a captain of the Swiss Guards, which he never was. Uh, but he, he is a man that knew very well how to get attention and how to make connections and be able to get himself in the right place at the right time. The unfortunate thing with him is he had these extraordinary opportunities, but in a lot of ways wasted those opportunities. Um, and we'll go into talking about uh, the settlement there at Sutter's Fort and how extensive it actually was and, and for a time was actually quite profitable. But ultimately, his willingness to work and actually put in the effort to continue to have a successful business... Um, I would think it would be, with the amount of resources that he had at his disposal, you could be successful for a short period of time, but ultimately you'd wind out failing if you continued to have the same practices that sort of plagued him throughout his life. 
And that's ultimately what happened. His businesses, to some degree, got saved by his son, John Augustus Sutter Jr., but ultimately, in the end, um, with the gold rush happening and the, go, the crowds of people coming in and just destroying everything and stealing everything from them, you know, it was it was a moot venture in the end. But uh, he made a number of acquaintances there in the Kingdom of Hawaii, and then ultimately he also went to uh, what would be eventually become Alaska. He uh, made friends with the governor, the Russian governor there, so he made acquaintances as well. So he was able to, when he went to California, uh, that territory, and then eventually go and talk to the governor uh, of that territory, uh, Alvarado, he had enough connections that it made him look, this guy's legit, you know, he, he can, you know, it's sort of funny to have the thing, like, if you go to a place that you're, say you're not supposed to be, but you're dressed for the occasion, people will think that you belong there. Uh, they had, uh, it was a, it was a, presidential event I think for Obama and some guy and his wife showed up and they looked like they belonged and they got in and it just sort of shows you know perception is everything so in this case the perceptions and in some cases they were warranted simply because he had made all uh, these acquaintances and, and really helped himself in that regard so in that that regard he was a brilliant man he really knew whether he call it manipulation or, or whatever it might be, he was able to put himself in the right place at the right time and acquire this land, which was like 48,480 acres or something like that. And, and he presented his dream, his utopia, agricultural utopia, to the uh, uh, Governor Alvarado. And uh, he presented this as this would be good for Mexico. It'd be developing the land, it'd be keeping the indigenous people in line, and he could keep out those that they did not want. Because remember, in the Texas Territory, which caused the whole American-Mexican War, <coughs> they, uh, they had graciously allowed settlers to come into Texas, but did not expect the amount of people. And it sort of overtook that territory, the settlers did. And ultimately decided we don't want to be part of the Republic of Mexico. And, you know, the whole remember the Alamo and all that stuff happened, which eventually led to the annexation of California, uh, the Arizona, New Mexico territories, as well as like the Nevada, Utah regions as well. And that's, you know, what completed the continental United States and ultimately for James K. Polk uh, after that, uh, that war. Uh, and it really was one of those wars. It was in a lot of ways it was unjust. Um, but they knew what they were doing. James K. Polk had said, I want to expand uh, America's borders. And when the opportunity presented itself, he took it. Uh, he was smart. You know, he did everything. He was one of those presidents that he actually he laid out a plan and said, this is what I want to do in my presidency. I'm only going to run one term. And he did everything they said he was going to do. So um, it was one of those things that how it all worked out and... And Sutter sort of wormed his way in right before all that stuff started to happen. And it was also, it was it was one of those things in Mexico from their perspective, because of what happened in Texas, it really seemed like a good idea. Because, one, you would be starting to utilize the resources of land, which would be advantageous to the Mexican government, the, you know, the taxes you would get and, and all that, not knowing gold was there yet or anything like that, but... It was a really fertile land, and it was a trophy territory for them. But it also, you know, because of what had been going on um, with the the Native Americans in the American territories, they thought something of that nature could happen in California because there were between 100,000 and 700,000 Native Americans in that area. Now, the disparity in number, I think it's more so than anything, just they really don't know. And they're just guessing it was between between those numbers. So it, it was a substantial population. So they felt having somebody there as a military force, sort of keeping that in line. And then part of the agreement was as well that he would dissuade individuals from settling, especially the American settlers, because they didn't want to repeat of Texas. 
and he agreed to all that. He agreed to become a Mexican citizen, and then he had to stay on the land for a year, and then the land would be officially his. And he would act in, in, in essence, a de facto governor and sort of that military presence, and he would he would convey the laws and things of that nature. So from the Mexican government, Republic of Mexico's perspective, it was a good deal. Uh, and, uh, and from uh, Sutter's acquaintances that he had made, especially with the governor of the Russian uh, American colony that was there, the operations there, he had learned about the Sacramento Valley and, and where the river went. So he was highly attracted to that area because he knew it was fertile soil. It would make for a perfect place where an agricultural settlement and some place where he could be very, very successful. And in his mind, not necessarily have to do a whole lot. Um, because of the native populations, there was a workforce there. Probably didn't set out, in essence, to do what he ultimately did, but he saw the possibilities and saw ahead. And he was one of those guys that saw the future and he, you know, presented himself well and he got what he wanted. So that sort of sets up everything for what we're about to talk about. So this is actually going to go into the first person accounts what actually happened, what led through the period uh, leading up to the American-Mexican War, eventually the annexation of California, the role that he played throughout that time period, and then ultimately when his land and everything was destroyed and moved to Washington, D.C., and then wind up moving to the end of his life, moving to Lidditz, Pennsylvania. And we'll talk about what all happened in those regards. So most of what happened with Sutter's Fort uh, it had a lot to do with the relationship with the Native Americans, which is where the story really is. Uh, Sutter's Fort is uh, is actually quite an impressive structure. Uh, it was a central building made of adobe bricks, surrounded by a high wall protection, uh, and uh, they also had uh, on opposite corners to guard against attack. Uh, it had workshops and stores, and produced all the goods necessary for. So this was a settlement that was very much able to take care of itself. Uh, he at first employed or enslaved Native Americans of the Miwok or Maidu tribes. Uh, the Hawaiians that he had brought with him from the uh, Kingdom of Hawaii uh, and also employed some Europeans at his compound. He had envisioned creating an agricultural utopia and once again I bring up the point whenever you hear the term utopia beware because there's somebody's going to suffer and in this case the native americans are the ones that suffered for it and for a time the settlement was in fact quite large and prosperous prior to the gold rush it was a destination for most immigrants that came into california via either the high passes of the sierra nevada including that ill-fated donner party in 1846 uh, whose rescue sutter contributed uh, but a lot of the people came through uh, what would become San Francisco, being that that was the only port. And this was a settlement you came to, uh, where Sacramento would eventually be built. Uh, in order to build his fort, he developed a large ranching and farming network in the area. He relied mainly on Indian labor, some Native Americans working voluntary, voluntarily for Sutter. Uh, and I'm probably going to get the names wrong here. The Nissanens the Miwoks, and the Akakames, but others were subjected to varying degrees of coercion that resembled slavery or serfdom, and not only resembled, but they in fact were. Uh, he believed that the Native Americans had to be kept strictly under fear in order to preserve, uh, in order to serve white landowners. And unfortunately, the housing and working conditions at the fort were very poor and have been described as enslavement with uncooperative Indians being whipped, jailed, or executed. Uh, his Native American employees uh, slept on bare floors and locker rooms without sanitation and ate from troughs made from hollow tree trunks. Um, the ranches that were in nearby villages, the situations for those people were more favorable. Uh, but probably not by a whole lot. Um, Sutter's fort manager wrote in a letter to a relative that the Indians of California make as obedient and humble slaves as the Negro in the South. And if Indians refused to work for him, Sutter responded with violence. Observers accused him of using kidnapping, food privation, and slavery in order to force the Indians to work for him. 
and generally stated that Sutter held Indians under inhumane conditions. And here starts uh, our first of the comments, uh, firsthand knowledge. Uh, his name was uh, Theodore Cordua. Uh, he was a German immigrant who leased land from Sutter, and he wrote, When Sutter established himself in 1839 in the Sacramento Valley, new misfortune came upon these peaceful natives of the country. Their services were demanded immediately. Those who did not want to work were considered as enemies. With other tribes, the field was taken against ho the hostile Indian. Declaration of war was not made. The villages were attacked usually before daybreak when everybody was still asleep. Neither old nor young was spared by the enemy, and often the Sacramento River was colored red by the blood of the innocent Indians. For these villages usually were situated at the banks of the rivers. During the campaign, one section of attackers fell upon the village by the way of land. All the Indians of the attacked village naturally fled to find protection on the other bank of the river. But there they were awaited by the other half of the enemy, and thus the unhappy people were shot and killed with rifles from both sides of the river. Seldom an Indian escaped such an attack, and those that, who were not murdered were captured. All children from 6 to 15 years of age were usually taken by the greedy white people. The village was burnt down, and a few Indians who had escaped with their lives were left to their fate. Another account was by Heinrich Leinhard. He was a Swiss immigrant that served as Sutter's major domo, wrote of the treatment of the enslaved once captured. As the rooms had neither beds nor straw, the inmates were forced to sleep on the bare floor. When I opened the door for them in the morning, the odor that greeted me was overwhelming, for no sanitary arrangements had been provided. What these rooms were like after ten days or two weeks can be imagined, and the fact that nocturnal confinement was not agreeable to the Indians was obvious. Large numbers deserted during the daytime or remained outside the fort when the gates were locked. He also claimed that Sutter was known to rape his Indian captives, even girls as, as young as twelve years old. And despite the procurement of fertile agriculture, let Sutter fed his Native American workforce in pig troughs, where they would eat gruel with the hands, their hands and the sun on their knees. Numerous visitors to Sutter's Fort noted the shock of this sight in their diaries. Alongside their discontent for his kidnapping of Indian children who were sold into bondage to repay Sutter's debts or given as gifts, American explorer and mountain man James Kleiman reported in 1846 that, the Captain Sutter keeps 600 to 800 Indians in a complete state of slavery, and as I had the mortification of seeing them dine, I may give a short description. Ten or fifteen troughs three or four feet long were brought out of the cookroom and seated in the broiling sun. All the laborers, great and small, ran to the troughs like so many pigs and fed themselves with their hands as long as the troughs contained even a moisture. Another individual, Dr. Weisserts of Sandals, a Swedish explorer who visited California in 1842 to 1843, also wrote about Sutter's brutal treatment of Indian captives in 1842. I could not reconcile my feelings to see these fellows being driven, as it were around some narrow troughs of hollow tree trunks, out of which, crouched on their haunches, they fed more like beasts than human beings, using their hands in hurried manner to convey to their mouths the thin porridge which was served to them. Soon they filed off to the fields after having, I fancy, half satisfied their physical wants. These concerns were even shared by Juan Bautista Alvaro, Alvaro, Alvarado, sorry, the governor of Alta, California, who deplored Sutter's ill treatment of the indige indigenous Californians in 1845. The public can see how inhumane were the operations of Sutter, who had no scruples about depriving Indian mothers of their children. Sutter had sent these little Indian children as gifts to people who live far from the place of their birth without demanding of them any promises that in their homes the Indians should be treated with kindness. Despite his promises to the Mexican government, Sutter was hospitable to the American settlers entering the region, ultimately leading to many of the conflicts that would wind up happening. So part of the issue when he let all these settlers in, um, they basically went in and took the land from the Native Americans. Uh, they replaced a lot of the wilderness with wheat fields. Uh, they shot most of the wild game in enormous 
uh, numbers, which was sort of like the same thing that they did with the Buffalo. Uh, it was just, it was ridiculous what they did. So basically, in essence, they wound out taking all the food from these Native American tribes. Once again, whether it was 100,000 to 700,000 uh, indigenous people, they just basically got to the point where they got fed up. So in response, they started raiding, the Indians started raiding the cattle of the white ranchers. And an article the California declared that in respect to the California Indians, the only effectual means of stopping inroads upon the property of the country will be to attack them in their villages. And on February 28, 1847, Sutter did just this. And he ordered two attacks that resulted in the Kern and Sutter massacres. Uh, much of his labor practices were illegal under Mexican law. However, in 1850, on April 22nd, following the annexation of California by the United States, the California state legislature passed the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which is ironic considering it legalized the kidnapping and forced servitude of Indians by white settlers. Uh, and in 1851, the civilian governor of California declared that a war of extermination will continue to be waged until the Indian race becomes extinct, and it must be expected. Uh, this expectation soon found its way into law. In 1851, a measure not only gave settlers the right to organize lynch mobs to kill Indians, but allowed them to submit their expenses to the government. And by 1852, the state had authorized over a million dollars in such claims. In 1856, a San Francisco Bulletin editorial stated, extermination is the quickest and cheapest remedy and effectually prevents all other difficulties when an outbreak of Indian violence occurs. In 1860, the legislature passed a law expanding the age and condition of Indians available for forced slavery. Uh, now finally, Sacramento Daily sort of spoke out against it and talked about that this law got through. Uh, from the pressure of lobbyists interested in profiting off enslaved Indians of pushing the law through, and they gave example how wealthy individuals had abused the law. Uh, this act authorizes as complete a system of slavery without any of the checks and wholesome restraints of slavery as ever, ever was devised, which what that exactly means, because I don't think there's anything wholesome about slavery, but I guess it was this version of slavery was even worse than what had gone on in the South. Uh, now, once again, as we talked about, he sort of caused a lot of the issues that would come. And part of it, there was a revolt uh, of the colony of California against the army of the mother country. Uh, Alvarado was eventually replaced as California governor by a brigadier general, uh, and he brought an army with him. Now, this army was basically made up of the most violent criminals from their prisons, and as soon as they came in, they started stealing, raping, and murdering, and eventually the California citizens rose up, got sick of it, and fought back. Now, Sutter, he was still Mexican citizen, and he was supposed to be the authority in the region. So he actually raised up an army and fought on the side of Mexico. Now, there was an individual named John Marsh who was a medical doctor and large, owner of a large ranch. Now, Marsh sided with the Californians and wanted no part of this effort with Sutter, but Sutter gave Marsh a choice, either join my army or be arrested and put in jail. So they wound up meeting in a battle, and unknown to Sutter, this Marsh went over to the California side, and you know there were Americans fighting against each other. He said, why are we fighting each other? So ultimately, the Americans on Sutter's side quit and ultimately costing the Mexican Republic the battle. So the Brigadier General, who wound out taking over as governor, wound up going back with his army to Mexico. And at that point, um, basically Sutter decided, as he con constantly would say he was a self-professed citizen of France, that he threatened if Mexico continued a war, uh, with them that he would announce them as a free separate colony off of Mexico under the protection of France. Uh, ultimately, though, uh, in 1846, uh, John B. Montgomery, who was a U.S. naval captain, wound up coming in after uh, a battle at Monterey, 
he raised the American flag there, and ultimately California would wind out uh, being annexed along with the territories in Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah, which would wind out completing uh, completing the American continental uh, states as we know it today. Now, in 1848, gold was discovered, uh, and it was discovered by one of his trusted employees, James Marshall, and they kept it hush-hush because he was afraid at that time he wanted to create a city on his land, and they had gotten to that point where they could do that, and he tried to keep it hush-hush, but there was a, an individual, a newspaper publisher, Samuel Brannon, who returned from Sutter's Mill to San Francisco with the gold that he had acquired there and began publicizing the find. Now, large crowds of people overran the land and destroyed nearly everything Sutter had worked for. To avoid losing everything, Sutter deeded his remaining land to his son, John Augustus Sutter, Jr. So just to give you a little bit of an example of how Sutter operated... Uh, when his son came uh, from Switzerland, uh, he wanted to impress his son, so he asked uh, the Lionheart that we had talked about earlier if he could wind out borrowing, in essence, his half of the gold uh, to, you know, once again, impress his son. So when Sutter Jr. had taken over his uh, father's debt-ridden business, he was unable to return the share when he found this out. Uh, Leinhardt finally accepted, uh, I guess, Sutter's flock of sheep as payment. Uh, the younger Sutter, Sutter Jr., who had come from Switzerland, uh, he joined his father in September of 1848. So he actually saw the commercial possibilities of the land and promptly started plans for building a new town, Sacramento, which, uh, which he named Sacramento after the Sacramento River. This actually made... Uh, John Augustus Sutter, pretty resentful because he had wanted a town named Sutterville for them or for him, and he wanted it built near this settlement that he had originally had. But uh, the son ultimately won out that argument, but it just sort of showed who he was. He's ultimately a very self-centered individual. Ultimately, though, Sutter had to give up a uh, new Helvetia to pay for the last of his debts. He wound up rejoining his family and lived in the Hawk Farm uh, in California along the Feather River. Uh, but it eventually, it burnt down and he wound up moving to Washington, D.C. Uh, but in 1853, the California legislature made Sutter a major general, and that's why they call him General uh, Sutter. Uh, another thing that happened is he had a land grant and the squatters association, which doing with dealing with this whole gold rush thing, they basically were trying to challenge that. Uh, he ultimately apparently won, but he had to wind out selling it off and with the, uh, ultimately with the, uh, taxes and everything, uh, he wound up getting some reimbursement. Uh, which was a pension of 250 a month from the government. Uh, but he continued to battle till about 1871, and that's when he moved from Washington, D.C. to Lidditz, Pennsylvania, and he built the home there across from the Lidditz Springs Hotel. Uh, he moved to Lidditz, one, because of his proximity to Washington, D.C., uh, but also the healing qualities of the Lidditz Springs, which appealed to him in his, his uh, older state. Uh, he also wanted three of his grandchildren to have the benefits of the fine private Moravian schools. Um, and he kept on going back into Washington, D.C. to looking for restitution from having the prospectors destroy his crops, slaughter his cows, and he basically left them the only thing he was left with was his own gold. So it, I think that's one of the things, too, you'll find in the uh, overall look at his life is that he sort of thought he was penniless when he died, when, in fact, he actually was still pretty well off. He was able to build this really beautiful home, which is on National Registry of Historic Places. Uh, he was wanted to send his children, grandchildren to these Moravian schools like Linden Hall. That was not cheap either. Um, and he was able to make these trips back and forth to Washington, D.C., and he actually, uh, 
he passed away in Washington, D.C., and they had a bill that was sitting in Congress before they adjourned, it, which would have given Sutter $50,000. Uh, but they never put it through, and two days later, on June 18, 1880, he died. Uh, he was returned to Lidditz and is buried adjacent to God's Acre, which is the Moravian graveyard there in Lidditz. And uh, the following January, his wife died, and she's buried with him. Uh, but that's sort of, that's the tale of his life and just sort of who he was as a person. You know, there's there's a lot of things that you can say about him to say he did some things that were extraordinary, uh, he was obviously a brilliant man. Uh, he had a lot of failings, but he certainly was a cruel man. Um, and he was willing to do whatever it took to attain the things that he wanted in his ut utopia. So that is the story of John Augustus Sutter uh, in a lot more detail. This is a little bit of a longer video, but I thought it was necessary to tell the whole story. Uh, you know, there's no doubt, like I said, you know, you can't deny certain things that he did were impressive. But uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, I also don't feel sorry for him for losing all that he was given uh, because he had ample opportunity to do the right thing and, and leave a di completely different legacy. But he chose not to. And therefore, this is how he's remembered. Uh, and it's unfortunate because... You know, that's the type of legacy you leave. It's a sad thing. And that's why there's uh, Black Lives Matter, especially a couple of years back, was starting to go around with different statues. And that's why his statues were one of the things in the Sacramento region that were um, asked to be removed. And also why, like, the General Sutter Inn, which is across the street and let it from uh, the John Augustus Sutter home, uh, and it's now na renamed uh, the Lidditz Springs Inn and Spa, which is pretty similar to originally called the Lidditz Springs Hotel, but it had changed its name in 1930 to the General Sutter Inn. They had a statue there and everything. And part of it with the owners were like, we don't want this place to be vandalized. Lidditz in general was like, we don't want that kind of publicity. So it's understandable why they changed the name, and not just because of that, but also because of the legacy that he actually left. And it's just one of those legacies that a lot of people aren't aware of. So uh, this is, like I said, it's more of a downer video, but it is, it's the truth of history. And the truth of history needs to be represented, you know, whether good or bad. Uh, so I want to thank you guys for coming along. Uh, and as always, we will see you all about town.